<coughs> thank the member. The question before the chair is that the amendment be agreed to, and I call the member for Macquarie. Thank you, Deputy Chair. And I rise to support this bill and in particular to speak about the amendments that the member for Blacksland has moved that I see as really key to Australia having a transparent and open trade negotiation system as we move forward. I have to say, listening to the member for Lyne, I, I admire his optimism and his hope for the benefits that this agreement may bring. But in fact, one of the key issues that Labor has with the way the agreement has been negotiated is that there has been no independent modelling. There has been no Australian-funded independent modelling to really look not just at the economic benefits but at the social benefits as well. And I want to talk about um, some of those aspects. Now, it isn't just this side of the House that believes independent modelling is important. As a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I've had the privilege of working through two inquiries, into the, one into the first TPP and the second into TPP 11. And I think all members were very clear in our report that independent modelling is a favourable thing to have in general on a trade agreement. And you can read the reports and see the committee's comments on that. For this agreement in particular, it, it should have been vital. Uh, I'm not the only one who's calling for it. The, the independent economic modelling has been called for by some of the largest business and industry groups in this country, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Minerals Council of Australia, the Harper Review called for it, the Productivity Commission has called for independent modelling, the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade and the Joint Standing Committee on Trade and Investment Growth. So, so there is a general belief that before we proceed it is much, much better to have independent modelling. And so I welcome uh, Labor's long-standing commitment to this, that, that if we uh, take office, we will introduce. Uh, I think what's concerning is that the modelling that has been done might burst the balloon a bit of some of the people who think that this is going to suddenly, you know, in the next few months, uh, bring about massive change. The Victorian government did undertake modelling uh, any modelling that has been done has shown very modest improvements in GDP over a decade. So not modest improvements next year, but modest improvements over a decade. And in fact, it's clear that the, uh, the organisations like the Minerals Council, the Business Council, the Australian Food and Grocery Council, the Australian Industry Group, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, National Farmers Federation and Winemakers Federation weren't really satisfied with the modelling that had been done and they commissioned their own. And recently Peter Petrie and Michael Plummer, uh, two US economists, have produced a report which, which I, I think we should be honest with the community about in terms of the benefits that it says will flow through. So the new modelling shows that the Australian agriculture sector stands to make zero gains under TPP 11. Zero. The report also acknowledges that durable manufacturing will shrink in Australia by 2 per cent under TPP 11 and that any increase in exports will be completely offset by increased imports. So yes, there will be some winners, but we need to be really upfront about who the losers will be. The report, and this is one commissioned by the industry groups, showed Australia's grains exports would not change at all under TPP 11 and that all other agriculture could actually decline. Uh, they also say less than 0.5 per cent added to GDP in a decade's time. Now, to put that into context, that is about one and a half days of Australia's income. So that's the benefit that we could expect to see. Now, the you know, the, the, the point really is that we need to have independent modelling that this parliament has absolute confidence in as we progress negotiations and discussions around trade agreements. Uh, and I absolutely support uh, our, our position that that becomes mandatory. Um, you know, the, the other issues that have been raised uh, in this place are around the agreement um, really go to the process by which the agreements are negotiated. And as a member of JSCOT, I can, I can say how surprised I was that 
that the committee that is meant to pull apart a treaty and look at it doesn't get to do that until after Australia has signed it, before it's ratified, but after it's signed. So that really limits, the process really limits the ability of a committee. Now, a committee that that works hard to find agreement on these things, it's really not going to make a lot of difference given the current process that we have. So I, I absolutely support that there is a need to subject treaties to proper scrutiny by this parliament. We also need to include businesses and unions and all the other community stakeholders much more effectively in the negotiation process. Right now, they are essentially locked out. They get told things after the fact. This is not how it is done in the EU or in the United States. And so we do need to move to, to a better process, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. We also uh, are very clear that we won't accept ISDS uh, in treaties that we negotiate uh, when we ultimately come to government. And I, I think that's a really important thing. And while m uh, members on the other side seem to dismiss that, I have deep concerns about ISDS. So if I can talk about the process, Deputy Speaker, of negotiating uh, a trade agreement. One of the things that operates really effectively in other parts of the world, and remember we are negotiating with places all around the, all around the globe and our process needs to stand up the, to the same scrutiny their, theirs does. And what gives people confidence in those places that the agreement that a government signed is actually going to be in the best interests of that country is that they have a program similar to what we're calling an accredited trade advisors program. So this program means you, know, you, you will need to, to agree to keep certain things confidential, but it gives you an insight into the process of negotiation as it happens. This seems eminently sensible to me. And an accredited trade, trade advisors program would allow industry, uh, all sorts of industry groups with different, different interests, the union movement and civil society groups, to get to be able to give real-time feedback on the agreement, it is too late at the end of an agreement being signed for these groups to raise really significant issues. Uh, so I think that is a, a, that the accredited trade advisors program we are proposing is a very positive step forward. In terms of strengthening the role of parliament in trade negotiations, uh, to actually use the existing Joint Standing Committee on Treaties and to require a government to put to that committee a statement of objectives for negotiation, for there to be consideration of that and feedback to a government. Again, we're really giving transparency to something that has not just an impact next year, but an impact for decades down, down, the, down the way. Uh, it would also involve J. Scott, the Joint Standing Committee, on having a briefing by government departmental officials at the end of every round of negotiations. This is a really sensible check and balance on, some, on a document that this parliament will be asked to endorse. Uh, and as I say, this is something that is done in other parts of the world. Of course, accredited advisers for the first stage of it need to be security cleared. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that would have to go around that. But I think we can trust business groups and I think we can trust unions and civil society to respect those things, knowing that they are having genuine input into what this parliament will ultimately decide or what a government will ultimately decide and ask this parliament to support. Yeah, it would need to represent the full span of community interests, including manufacturing, agriculture, digital trade, intellectual property, services, small business. Small business seems not to get the benefits of these agreements that, that big business uh, sometimes receives, and they really need to be involved. The, the labour market. Uh, people involved in the labour market, environmental groups, consumer and public health organisations, as well as state and local governments, they should all have the opportunity to have input. 
So I think they are very sensible reforms, and while they were only announced earlier this week, they've already been endorsed by the Export Council of Australia, by the National Farmers Federation, by the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, by the Australian Fair Trade and Investment Network, and by the Australian Council of Tra Trade Unions. Uh, Deputy Speaker, some of the uh, other points that have come up on the course of the Joint Standing Committee inquiry uh, are, do relate to issues around labour market testing. And I remain concerned about the consequences, and I think we'll, we will need to be vigilant in the implementation of the agreement. What the TPP 11 does is waive ma labour market testing for contract, what are called contractual service suppliers for six of the countries in the partnership. And that means workers from Canada, Peru, Brunei, Mexico, Malaysia and Vietnam will be able to be offered jobs without Australians being offered them first. Now, I think that is a lot to ask a community to accept. And I do think there needs to be absolute vigilance in the way that that is implemented to ensure that at a time when many in Australia are concerned about underemployment and low wages, that uh, that we watch to look at the impacts of that. And I should point out that uh, the independent modelling that was done by the industry groups actually looked at the impact of the TPP-11 on wages. And the report is only brief on wages, but it does indicate that wages would, after a decade, only grow by a minuscule amount of 0.46 per cent per year, or about $10 a year in 2030. So, so that is another area where we need to really follow closely. Uh, the, the other issue that has um, set alarms off for me is around skills testing. And I'm really grateful to the ETU and the ACTU for their work that they did with the committee on identifying concerns about skills testing. Now, yes, we say people can only come to the country when their skills are considered to be on a par with Australia. Unfortunately, getting the measure of that could potentially have life-threatening consequences when it comes to industries like construction and, in particular, uh, the electrical contracting sector. Now, Australia has exceptionally high standards for electricians working. You don't get to become an electrician only because you know how to fit a light bulb in a domestic environment. You are required to cover a whole range of electrical contracting skills. And I can see nods from the member on the other side. Uh, and indeed, uh, it, is a, it is a very high skill set. And that's because we take seriously the lives of the electricians doing the work and the lives of people who will be working in the buildings or on the sites where that work's been done. So uh, I do note the concerns that have been raised of less qualified and, and inexperienced tradespeople working in Australia because they may not be subject to our rigorous testing processes. Uh, I, again, these are issues that we take very seriously. Uh, and finally, the uh, Another area where Labor will, when we ultimately take government, address is the area of ISDS. Now, it does get dismissed by people who say, this, this doesn't really count for us, it's not really a big deal. But let's be very clear about what ISDS is. ISDS allows a foreign company to sue the Australian government where there is an agreement in place that this is allowed to happen. That Kate, court case then gets heard not in an Australian court, not in a court of that other country, but in a completely separate judicial process. Uh, and and the, having heard the unpacking of that process, I have to say it raises huge concerns about the outcomes. Even if a finding goes in favour of the country that has been sued and, and it's not found to have been in breach, there are still enormous legal costs that are involved for a country that has to go through ISDS, uh, um, a, a, an ISDS uh, challenge. So I think it is, it's, was, has always been the view of Labor members of the committee, and, and it will now be Labor policy 
that we will not allow agreements to be negotiated with ISDS clauses. I note that New Zealand, with Jacinta Ardern as Prime Minister, has written a side letter with the countries to remove ISDS uh, uh, from the agreement, and we would certainly be seeking to do that. So uh, I think as we, as we look at this legislation, my advice to this parliament is to be open and transparent with communities about what is really involved. We need to be brutally honest about the benefits and we need to be brutally honest about the downsides. I thank the honourable member.